you and Claire for joining us. Um, we have a short introduction to Smith Life Home Care. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Kathleen McGinnis. I'm Director of Community Relations for Smith Life Home Care for the last uh, three years. And um, I see a lot of familiar faces today, so we want to say thank you for your support. Hi, Susan Blum, I see you, um, <laughs> and many others out there. Uh, a few quick updates. We'd like to um, just remind you that over 60% of our caregivers have been vaccinated. We've been vaccinating caregivers and staff since January 3rd. Even though they told me I was too young, I was lucky enough to get a vaccine. Um, uh, so um, I think it's really important that we do have um, such a great amount of vaccinated caregivers and that we also do COVID testing two times a week in our Rockville location. A friendly reminder that we also serve Washington DC. We serve all of Montgomery County and Washington, D.C., and have been serving Washington, D.C. for the last 18 months, and we have very competitive caregiving rates. So, in addition to providing um, certified nursing assistant caregivers for companion care, hospice care, dementia care, we also have several great short-term discharge packages that will help your clients, if you're a social worker, uh, get out of the hospital. It's a five hour package that's $125. It will pick them up at Sibley Hospital, Georgetown Hospital, pick them up, wait for them because nobody ever gets out on time. Uh, take them to stop by the store, pick up their prescriptions, get them home, get them in their jammies, and all of this for five hours and $125, whether you're Washington DC or Montgomery County. I cannot get my own children to do that for less than 125. So I strongly encourage you all to take advantage of that. Um, our phone number is 301. 816-5020 and ask for, wait a minute, yes, sorry, um, ask for Kathleen or Brittany. And last but not least, um, if you are an expert in your area of business and want to join us as a care partner, we have an Ask the Expert um, Facebook program that comes on at 10 a.m. the second and fourth Tuesday of every month. I invite you to join us for our next Ask the Expert on February 9th at 10 a.m. And Susie Murphy will be um, sharing Deborah Levy Elder Care and what their area of expertise is. So if you're interested in being spotlighted, please give me a call on my cell phone, evenings or weekends. I don't have a life yet, but I'm going to. 301 873 5506 is my cell phone if you're interested in being in our Ask the Expert program. So on with the show, we would like to introduce Claire, who has graciously agreed to speak with us today. Um, I first heard her speak maybe two years ago at a Sibley employee intro, which she does or used to do for all onboarding staff. It's a great program. Uh, a little bio about Claire is Claire has been an emergency nurse for 14 years. She serves as the LGBTQ resource nurse for two John Hopkins hospitals. In this role, Claire provides the LGBTQT health education for staff, community outreach, and advocacy for patients as well as employees. Also, as an emergency nurse at Frederick Health Hospital, Claire has implemented LGBTQT, LGBTQ health education and continues to encourage inclusive practices with the organization. Claire is vice chair of the Frederick Center, which provides education and advocacy to the Frederick County LGBTQ community. She's the owner of Rainbow Education and Consulting for Health, 
and she provides health training for organizations like ours and maybe yours too. So she's fabulous. She's going to give you her contact information at the end of this presentation in case you would like to engage her. And I'll give you her email right now. She's also, uh, don't forget, certified in plant-based nutrition and she helps support diet and lifestyle improvements. We should do coffee, Claire. Um, her email is vegan, V-E-G-A-N, for numeric for life2014 at gmail.com. And we will provide this information to you in the chat and Claire will provide it at the end of her presentation. Last but not least, please put your questions and answers in the chat uh, format. We are happy to answer your questions. We have time saved for Q&A at the end. Um, and we need the program to continue through for the next 35, 40 minutes or so. Okay, have I forgotten anything? Nope, okay. Thank you all. We're grateful you're here today and we look forward to sharing information on this important community topic. All right, hello everyone. Um, happy, what is it, Tuesday, Monday, Wednesday? I have no idea anymore. Um, but thank you for getting up early for those of you on the West Coast. Um, I'm Claire Madrigal, as Kathleen had introduced. Let me just share my screen really quick. Let me know if you cannot see. And I appreciate those of you that have um, left your cameras on because you have no idea what it's been like to just present to a bunch of little black boxes for the last year. Um, so anyways, I would like to get started with um, going over some basic terminology um, and then we'll talk about communication. We'll go into a little bit of health, disparity, health disparities and barriers to care and then how you can all create inclusive practices. So I know most of you are social workers, but you might all be coming in from different disciplines of healthcare. Um, like Kathleen had mentioned, I've been a nurse for feels like forever, but 14 going on 15 years. Um, and I've seen the landscape of, of medicine and healthcare and how it's changed so much. So I'm really excited that so many of you um, came to join me this morning to talk about how you can make your practices and your everyday you know, practices with, with what you see with your patients and not just your patients, but your colleagues and friends and family. Um, so I'm currently located in Frederick, Maryland, but um, I work a lot of the time in DC, which is at Sibley Hospital, a lot of you know. Um, and DC actually has a 10% self-identified LGBTQ population. So 10% of DC is LGBTQ. Um, and that's, that's from the most recent Gallup poll um, that is done by the Williams Institute in 2019. Um, so I, I see the numbers going up as time goes by, as acceptance, you know, becomes more widely happening, um, as there's more education and, and folks, um, you know, are, are learning more. Um, it's not that there's more LGBTQ people than, you know, 50 years ago. Um, there's a lot of reasons for, you know, there being a greater percentage of population. Um, acceptance is one of them. We did loss a, a lot of our ancestors, you know, during the AIDS HIV epidemic. Um, you know, and during the 60s and 50s. So, you know, there's a lot of a lot of younger folks that are identifying as LGBTQ. So a lot of your kids and grandkids. So it's important that you all know this terminology for them as well. So LGBTQ, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, um, there's a lot more terminology. Um, but I want to really break down the foundational, you know, um, concepts of that. So even though we throw all of those terms into one big acronym, we need to actually break it down into gender identity, who you are, and sexual orientation, who you're attracted to. So let's start with gender identity. So gender identity is formed in our brains. Um, this is where we develop our sense of gender, whether that's male or female or non-binary or something else. Um, many people are in this galaxy and they don't fit into the blue and pink boxes that we love to shove, you know, kids into from even before they're born. We do the ultrasounds and we're like, oh, it's a boy and it's a girl, but actually we don't know someone's gender until they tell us. Um, kids can actually articulate their gender identity as young as two or three years old, but it really just depends on how that, that is fostered. So if, if I was a little kid and I told my parents, hey mom, I actually feel like a boy. And if they were like, oh no, you don't, just you know, keep wearing your dresses and play with your Barbies, you know, I might not bring it up again because that wasn't fostered for me. So it really just depends on that home environment. 
Um, but a lot of folks will come out later in life, you know, like teenage years or even, you know, 50s, 60s. I've, um, I actually had a patient who was, I think she was 88 and she was finally coming out as transgender. Um, it wasn't safe for her to do so in her 20s and she wasn't accepted by her family. So it took her up until, you know, being in her 80s for her to come out. Um, I, I love, I love her. I wish I could tell you more about her. Um, but so just understand that people can come out at any stage of life, whether you're two years old or 88 years old. Um, so we have been conditioned, you know, all of our lives to think that gender matches with our biological sex. Um, and that's just not accurate. So our biological sex is really complex. So it's, it's a combination of our genitals, our hormones, our chromosomes. And there's even more chromosomal variations that, you know, that are just XX and XY. There's a lot more than that. Um, so even our biological sex can be non-binary or can be more than just male and female. Um, and so cisgender is a term that you might hear me use throughout this presentation. Cisgender means you feel affirmed in the gender identity that you were assigned. So I am cisgender. I was assigned female at birth. You know, I came out of my mom. They said, it's a girl just purely based on my external genitals. And I identify with being a girl, with being female woman. So those things match up what I was assigned at birth and how I feel about my gender. It just happens that those things match up. So folks that are transgender, it simply means that, you know, those things don't match up. What they were assigned at birth was incorrect. Um, so whether, you know, I mean, so to be transgender, um, you don't have to be on hormones. You don't have to have surgery. You don't have to have done any medical intervention. Intervention. It simply means that what you're assigned was incorrect. And the doctors are just doing, you know, the best they can with looking at the baby's genitals and saying it's a boy or it's a girl. Um, but often they'll get it wrong because we know that in the United States alone, we have 1.4 million transgender people, at least that have come out in surveys. So there might actually be more. Um, and so transgender simply means that what you're assigned was incorrect. So when a patient tells you that, you know, it's important that you mark that in their chart and that you're calling them by the correct name and pronouns that they, they disclose to you. Um, but don't assume because someone says that they're transgender that they've had any sort of surgery or medical interventions. Um, and that information should only be asked to our patients if that's relevant to their care. So me as an emergency room nurse and say the patient comes in for like abdominal pain, I need to know what organs that they have. So that would be important for me to ask those questions. Um, but if they're coming in for like a laceration or like a cut on their finger, I probably don't need to know about, you know, their genital surgeries. Um, but we do ask every patient, you know, what surgeries have you had? Because it can be important. Another term that you might hear quite frequently is non-binary. So non-binary simply means not of two things, not binary. So binary is blue and pink, boy and girl, black and white. Like we put everything in these boxes in our society. Um, we love to like, we have to label things and we have to put it in a box. Otherwise we just can't deal with it. Um, but a lot of folks are non-binary. They just, they don't wanna be confined. They are not confined to those blue and pink boxes. So. You know, we used to say that gender is on a spectrum, but I heard um, someone who's non-binary refer to it as a galaxy because gender isn't necessarily like between here and here. For some people, it might be out in that galaxy. So I really like that turn of phrase. Okay, so sexual orientation. So we just talked about gender identity. That's who you are. And sexual orientation is very separate. This is who you love, who you're attracted to, whether that's sexual, emotional, or romantic attractions. So we're most familiar with the term heterosexual or straight, meaning attraction to someone of the opposite gender. And that's kind of like the default in our society, unfortunately. And we, we really need to get away from that mindset because there's more than just straight people and everyone that's, that's not straight shouldn't be othered. Um, so there's actually a lot of sexual orientations um, and, and more terms than I'm going to talk about here. So some really frequent terms you're going to hear are gay, meaning you're attracted to someone of the same gender, or lesbian, which is a term reserved just for women and non-binary folks attracted to other women and non-binary folks. I am a lesbian and I'm also gay. So I get two, two terms are, are mine. So um, men only get gay. They, they only get one thing in this, in this situation. So um, you might hear folks use those interchangeably. I use them interchangeably kind of just depending on who I'm talking to. Um, like, I don't know, if I'm just talking to someone I hardly know, I might use the term gay because that's just a more widely accepted term. Um, bisexual means that you're attracted to your gender and a gender that's not your own. 
Um, so we used to say bisexual means you're attracted to both men and women, but we know that there's more than two genders. Um, so that's very limiting. So the bisexual community sometimes uses a phrase called bi plus. It's kind of like the plus that we have at the end of LGBTQ. It's just very inclusive. So basically if I were bisexual, I would be attracted to other women like me and other genders that are not my own. So men, trans men, trans women, non-binary folks. Does that make sense? Um, and pansexual, you might hear pansexual. I hear a lot of younger folks using the term pansexual. This is by no means a, a new term. Um, this isn't just invented today. It's, it's actually been around for a really long time. Um, so pansexual just means you're attracted to someone for who they are, regardless of their gender. Um, you're gonna hear a lot more terms for sexual orientation and for gender identity that you're not gonna understand. And that's totally fine. If a patient or a client or a friend or a family member uses a term that you don't understand, it's completely appropriate to say, hey, what does that mean to you? I've never heard that before, or I'm not sure what that means. Um, and don't worry, like most people will not be offended because it's, it's better to ask those questions and seem more interested than just to pretend you know and then literally have no idea what they're talking about. So the other part of the acronym is Q. So Q can be for questioning or queer. So questioning, you know, means you're just trying to figure it out. This happens for all of us, whether we're gay, straight, bisexual, um, transgender, cisgender. We're trying to figure out who we are. A lot of the times this happens for us in adolescence, um, but you know, we're all ever evolving human beings. So sometimes those, those things change and evolve over time. So I remember questioning my sexual orientation, probably, you know, when you think about when you started having crushes on people, how old were you? I was like, I don't know, seven, eight, nine, something around there. It was all a blur. Um, but that's when I remember sort of questioning who I'm attracted to, who do I have crushes on? Um, and that can change for some people over time and evolve. Um, so queer, queer is another term that you might hear me use throughout the presentation. Queer, a lot of folks know this term to be very derogatory, a very like no, no word that it's, you shouldn't say this, but actually probably over the last 30 years or so, we've taken back this word and we use it in a positive way. Um, there's a lot of terms that are out there that are, that are negative or negative connotations and have been used derogatorily but we've, a lot of communities take back those words and we're like, no, we're not gonna give you that power. So I personally love the word queer. I use this to describe myself. It's an umbrella term for sexual orientation and gender identity. But you know, a lot of folks that are working with older adults might not like this term. And I do not blame a lot of older adults for not liking this term. This was a term that was called to them you know, when they were bullied, when they were assaulted, when they were murdered. Um, and so you gotta be really careful with this word unless you're in the community. But if a patient or a client describes themselves as queer, that's okay to refer to them as queer. Um, so I might use queer interchangeably today instead of LGBTQIA+, because it's, it's, it's faster for me to say. Um, and I also really love the term. But just as a side note to be careful about who you use that with, especially if you're working with older adults. Okay, so this is the SOGI person. So SOGI stands for sexual orientation and gender identity. It's obviously much faster to say SOGI. Um, and so this is all of us. We all have gender identities. We all have a gender, whether that's male, female, non-binary, somewhere else in that galaxy. Um, pronouns, this is how we like to be addressed, you know, by being called he or she or they. Sexual orientation, this is who you're attracted to. Romantic, um, you know, emotional or sexual attractions. There's folks that don't, you know, that are asexual, that don't have sexual attractions, but they have emotional or romantic attractions towards other people. And then you're assigned sex at birth. This is, you know, your genitals, chromosomes, hormones. Um, and, and some people don't even know that they have extra um, organs, you know, like some folks are, are born intersex. Actually, 1.7% of the population is born intersex. Um, and so folks might not even know that they're intersex until they've gone to the hospital for some reason and had maybe a CAT scan or an ultrasound and find out, hey, look, I have ovaries and testicles. Um, so some folks don't even know for you know, a long time. Gender expression, this is what's on the outside. This is how we present ourselves to the world. Um, and we all kind of have our own gender expression. Um, sometimes, you know, I'm feeling a little bit more masculine. I might wear a suit. I might shave my hair off. I might not wear makeup. Um, sometimes I'm feeling a little bit more feminine. Like today, I actually put on eye makeup. It's been a really long time. So um, it just, everyone's gender expression is very, very different. 
Um, and a lot of trans folks will use gender expression to convey to the outside world, to the male person, to the grocery store person, like, hey, please call me ma'am or sir. Um, but we should always ask. So we're gonna talk about that. So avoiding assumptions. This should be a really big part of your practice as not just a clinician, but as a human. We should never assume anyone's gender or sexual orientation. Um, you know, we assume everyone is straight and cisgender unless proven otherwise, but we really should just not make the assumption in the first place. Um, and so how I do this, especially, you know, as a nurse that's seeing a million patients every day, when I walk into a patient's room, I'm gonna introduce myself with my pronouns and I'm gonna ask them how they like to be addressed. So we should be doing this with all of our clients, um, whether that's on the phone or in person. So I'll say, hey, I'm Claire, I'm gonna be your nurse today. I use she, her pronouns, how about you? Or I will say, hey, can you please confirm your name and date of birth for me? And then they will, and then I'll say, okay, great. Is that the name you go by? Like seven times out of 10, you know, Robert goes by Bob or MJ goes by Mary Jo, or, you know, there's so many different names that people use that are not their legal name. And this is the same for folks that are in the transgender community. Um, folks that are trans cannot often change their name very quickly. It's very expensive to do. It's a hard process to change your name. It's a whole legal thing. I actually changed my name when I was 16 for other reasons, um, but it was a really, you know, it's a big process. Um, and so folks that have those barriers, whether that's financial barriers or logistical barriers, or maybe they're younger and their parents aren't letting them change their name, um, they might go by a different name than what is on their chart, what's on their legal documents. And that's okay, you know, you don't have to change their legal documents, but you can definitely refer to them in your charting um, verbally when you talk about that patient with colleagues. Um, you want to call that person by the name and pronouns that they are asking you to use. So what are pronouns? I think we learned these in, what, third grade? Um, but, you know, they're coming back around because folks are using pronouns more readily. Pronouns are really important. Um, it might not seem important to those of us that are cisgender because we've used the same pronouns for our whole lives. But folks that are transgender and want and are need to use a pronoun that, that correlates with their gender identity, um, this is a really big deal. So if a person was assigned male at birth and identifies as female, you know, they want, they might want you to use she, her pronouns. They want to be referred to as the woman that they are. Um, and so to be misgendered or to call them he by accident or on purpose can be really harmful. And you know, you're gonna make mistakes. I guarantee you 100% you are going to make mistakes with someone's pronouns or name and that's okay. And it really is about um, apologizing, moving on and doing better next time. Um, when you apologize about misgendering someone, don't make it a big old thing because that just makes it a bigger deal than it is. Um, just say, oh, I'm so sorry, and then correct yourself. Um, it's a really great idea to correct your colleagues, friends, and family too when they misgender someone um, because most folks are not doing this to be malicious by any stretch of the imagination. There are a few out there, but most people are not trying to be malicious um, when they misgender someone or call someone by the wrong name. So it's just a quick like, hey, reminder, oh, that person goes by Sally use she, her pronouns for her. Um, and that just kind of like keeps us in check and keeps our colleagues in check as well. And our friends and family. Um, you know, if, you're, if your nephew is going by he, him pronouns now, make sure your, your mom is calling that person the, the correct name and pronouns. And it's just a, a little quick reminder. So I wanna talk quickly about they, them pronouns. Um, so these are pronouns that are gender neutral. We use these pronouns every day on a daily basis all the time. Um, we don't even think about it. So let's say you went to the local coffee shop and then you ordered coffee and you're waiting at your table and you said, and then your friend walks up and you said, oh yeah, they're bringing the coffee over right now. We can get started. Um, or say you valeted your car and you know, you don't know who's driving your car. So you're gonna say, oh yeah, they're coming over right now with the car. You just use gender neutral pronouns without even realizing it. Or, you know, you dropped key, someone dropped their keys on the ground and you said, oh, look, oh, they dropped their keys, here you go. Um, so we use these pronouns all the time for a singular person. So for a lot of us, it is practice to use this when referring to pers a person that we know or a patient or a client. Um, so it's a really good idea to, to practice this. When I am out and about, um, you know, say I'm at the grocery store with my wife and you know, I see someone next to the bananas and I'll say, oh, their haircut is so cute. Or look at their purse, look at their 
shoes. Like, I don't know that person's gender, so I'm not going to make an assumption. Um, so, but I'm going to use those, those gender neutral pronouns throughout until I know that person's gender. All right, so gender neutral conversations. This is kind of the same concept. Um, we love to use ma'am and sir. I've, I've only recently moved to Maryland. I guess not recent anymore. It's been a few years since I've been in the Maryland area, um, but people here love ma'am and sir. And I understand that this is a military area and, and this is just a very commonly used um, words to uh, be very respectful of someone. And I, and I appreciate that. Um, but until you know someone is a ma'am or a sir, just maybe hold off on that. So until you've introduced yourself and found out what that person likes to be called, then go ahead and use ma'am or sir, or maybe nothing at all in, in case they don't use that. Um, so instead of saying she is here for her appointment, you can say the patient or the client or they are in the waiting room. Um, and here's another big one. I, I hear this all the time, especially when I take like pediatric courses. Every example is, the mom and the dad, the mother and the father. Um, but we know that there's more family dynamics than just the mom and the dad. You know, some families have one mom, some families have two dads, some families have a foster parent. So instead of always assuming that this child that you're working with or, you know, you're talking about someone's parents, use gender neutral terms like parents or guardians because you don't want to put that on that kid that maybe doesn't know how to speak up for themselves just yet. Maybe they're, you know, recently in foster care and, you know, their mom and their dad are, you know, not able to take care of them. That might be really painful for them. So until you know about someone's parents, just say parents, no big deal, or guardians. Um, also, when you're talking about someone's partner, never assume who their spouse is. I see this happen all the time in the ER, um, you know, if, if we are taking a sexual history of, for a patient for you know, a medical reason, or we're trying to talk about who their care partner is, um, and then we assume that this male patient has a wife, and that might not be accurate. Um, and so if you're assuming someone's partner, and there's, there's already like a power dynamic there with, with doctors and patients, or care providers and patients, um, they might not feel safe or comfortable speaking up or correcting you. And this is especially the case with our older adults. Our older adults have lived through a pretty rough time where they have not had a lot of rights as LGBTQ people. Um, and so they might not feel safe or comfortable correcting you and saying, no, actually I have um, a male partner of 50 years. So just keep that in mind that this isn't, you know, we're not just saying use gender neutral terms for everybody all the time. It's just make sure you know who the person is that they're talking about before making that assumption. Okay, so stigma and discrimination has led to a lot of health disparities within the community. Um, so I, I, if you take away anything from the health disparities that I'm gonna go over, I want you to really take in that these health disparities do not exist because someone is LGBTQ. They exist because of societal and systemic discrimination. And when you add other factors like race and gender and socioeconomic status, when all of those other factors intersect with someone's identity as being LGBTQ, um, this, this gives them additional social determinants of health. So if you grow up not feeling supported or loved by your family, or your church, or your community, or your teachers, or your or your playground kids, um, you you might use negative coping mechanisms to survive, to get by. Um, a lot of us are working with older adults, so I, but I just want to touch on our LGBTQ youth. Our youth are more likely than cisgender and heterosexual kids to attempt suicide, to use substances, to use and abuse substances and be homeless. So if you think about 100% of homeless kids out there, 40% of those kids are LGBTQ. And this, these are the kids that, you know, were kicked out of their homes for coming out. Um, they're not welcome there. Um, they don't feel safe to be there. So if our kids are growing up on the streets, they're already learning some pretty negative coping skills to just survive. Um, and then obviously when they become adults, they have a lot more, you know, mental health concerns um, and, you know, just overall housing concerns. So these are the, the patients that you're gonna, gonna be working with. Um, so with adults, a lot of our health disparities have to do with lack of provider knowledge um, and not ordering preventative screenings appropriately. 
So for example, lesbians and transgender men, folks that have a uterus, are often under the assumption of information and misinformation um, that they don't need reproductive screenings. I have a friend who is a lesbian and she was telling me how she went to her primary care doctor and she was like, oh yeah, it's been a while, I need a pap smear. And the, her doctor knew she was a lesbian and said, oh, but you don't have sex with men, so you don't have a pap smear. You don't need pap smears. And thankfully she's a nurse and she knows better. And she said, no, actually I do need pap smears. You know, the guidelines state every three years, folks with a uterus need to have a pap smear. Um, but that kind of misinformation gets spread around the community because if my doctor told me lesbians don't need pap smears and then I'm having lunch with my friend and she's a lesbian and I was like, oh yeah, you're good. You don't need pap smears. That's how misinformation spreads around the community. And then just imagine for a second that you're a transgender man and you have a uterus and you know you need a pap smear. So you make an appointment with the gynecologist and you go in for your visit. And then the front desk stuff is the front desk staff is like, why is this guy here for a pap smear? And then they might look at you funny, they might make some jokes, they might laugh behind the, the desk there. And you know, we all see what happens behind the desk, and you're already feeling anxious and kind of embarrassed to be there. Um, and so when these negative experiences happen, you're just less likely to go back for preventative screenings. Um, so gay and bisexual men and transgender women have higher rates of HIV and STIs. And if we are not asking our patients appropriate um, sexual history questions, sexual health questions, which I, I honestly, I don't see a lot of providers, nurses, doctors, PAs asking these questions as much as they should, because most people are not taught how to ask these questions. Most people are embarrassed to ask these questions. A lot of patients, you know, have never been asked these questions. So if we're not screening our patients appropriately, knowing which folks are at higher risk for certain things, um, they're not gonna get those screenings. They're not gonna get those HIV tests that they need. Um, so we know a lot of us that work in LGBT health and, and most of us should know um, black transgender women have higher rates of HIV. So they're at disproportionate rates. They're more vulnerable to getting HIV. And if we're not asking those questions appropriately, if we don't know that this person is trans, if we don't know that this person might be um, engaging in, you know, high risk behaviors for survival, perhaps, um, we might not be telling her that she needs to get an HIV test more often. Um, and so this can, of course, perpetuate that. Um, Substance abuse, like I already talked about, is the same for adults as kids. We have higher rates of substance abuse, whether that's alcohol or drugs or marijuana or prescription drugs. Um, this, this kind of does go back to part of our history and our only safe spaces, and, and sometimes still are, are gay bars. Um, you know, the only place that we could be around our folks, around other gay and trans people, were at gay bars. And so what do you do in a bar? You drink alcohol. Um, and when people drink, they're more likely to use drugs or um, cigarettes. So some of those rates go up as well. So we have to, to have more spaces. We have to have more community centers, more bookstores, more coffee shops that are LGBTQ friendly. A lot of us are lucky to be in the DC area who actually has an LGBT community center. There's coffee shops that are friendly. Um, if you're in New York, you're super lucky because there's, there's actual like gay neighborhoods and gay coffee shops and bookstores and places where you feel safe. You don't just have to go to a bar um, to be around community. And that's, that's the case for a lot of marginalized communities. If you don't have a place to like go and be with your people, I mean, those kind of spaces are so, so important um, just for your overall well-being. Um, rejection is incredibly common for LGBTQ folks um, and unfortunately being assaulted is as well. So I want to talk about just trans disparities for a quick second. Trans folks experience violence disproportionately, so, so much disproportionately. Um, 60% of trans folks have been physically attacked or threatened in their lifetime. And the number of trans people murdered nationally and internationally is unfortunately rising. Um, the majority of the murders that happen in the United States are black transgender women under 30 years old. Like we have young women being murdered for who they are. I had a patient um, a little bit ago and we were talking about, you know, is she, you know, I was getting her social history and um, I think she was like 27. She was very, very young. And I said, oh, are you seeing anyone? Do you have a partner? And she was like, are you kidding me? Like, I am terrified. I'm afraid to date. Someone's gonna murder me. And she was dead serious. 
like she was so fearful at 27 years old. No one should be that afraid to just date. You should be dating and like meeting people and, you know, obviously not during a pandemic. Um, but this was, this was pre pandemic. And anyways, she was just very fearful and no one should be that fearful at 27 years old, but that is the reality of especially young black trans women. So if these folks are your patients or your clients and they come to you for whatever reason, whether it's housing or, you know, other social services that they need, just know that they're carrying that with them. Um, so if they're a little bit like not as readily available to give you information, they might not be as forthcoming because they don't trust a lot of people. And that is completely reasonable considering. So just keep that in mind. Um, and, and safety is, is number one priority. So um, suicide is, is higher for our LGBTQ kids and adults but especially for our trans kids and adults. So 40% of trans adults have attempted suicide in their lifetime, which is nine times the US average. Um, so just keep that in mind as well. Um, I work in the ER, so obviously I'm seeing a higher proportion of suicidal ideations come in and a lot of those folks are trans. Um, and it's not because trans folks inherently have mental health issues. It's because society treats them so terribly that they have anxiety, depression, and PTSD at greater rates. Um, and they're more likely to attempt suicide because maybe their family, their friends, their colleagues don't accept them. Um, and maybe they live on the streets, so they have even more social determinants of health. Um, a lot of folks will just avoid seeking healthcare altogether. They're not gonna reach out to you know, nurses and doctors and social workers because they're so afraid of being um, treated poorly. So I want to talk a little bit about our older adults. Um, I work really closely with the older adult population at Sibley. Um, Sibley has a 60% older adult population. We have a lot of older adults. Um, we are the hospital with like the greatest number of older adults, which I absolutely love. So we often have these um, uh, like events. We used to have events pre-pandemic and we'd call them like lunch and film. So we'd show an LGBTQ themed film. We'd have lunch. We'd like try to, you know, invite folks into the community to help mitigate the social, social isolation and discrimination that a lot of these folks have faced for, for far too long. Um, older adults have had a lifetime of discrimination. Folks that are in their 80s, 90s, even 70s have not had full and equal protections. Um, I mean, we still don't to this day. So, you know, back in the 50s, they lived through the lavender scare of the McCarthy era where folks were being, you know, fired from the government if they found out or even thought that they were gay. The 60s was the Stonewall riots where people were, you know, arrested um, and, you know, the riots broke out when, when folks were trying to just live. Um, and then, of course, the AIDS HIV epidemic of the 80s and 90s where the government, again, um, ignored a virus that was happening. Um, and so a lot of these folks do not trust us as healthcare providers. Um, 1973, or sorry, 19, yeah, 1973 was when um, homosexuality was removed from the DSM. So it's been only, you know, 40, 47 years or so since um, homosexuality was not a mental illness. illness. Um, and only recently has um, parts of gender dysphoria been removed as a mental illness. So for far too long, the LGBT community has been pathologized as having mental illness um, and, and just treated really poorly. So just keep this in mind when our older adults um, do not come out to us as readily. You know, I take care of older adults all the time at Sibley um, and, you know, I'll ask, oh, who do you have with you today? And then so often the person will say, oh, this is my roommate or this is my friend. And then, you know, if, if they feel safe or comfortable during our visit, they might actually tell me that that person is their partner of 30, 40, 50 years. Um, and they've only told me that because I maybe said something about my wife or I'm wearing rainbows or they feel safe to disclose that to me. Um, so you may not think that there's older adults in your home care um, office or your um, assisted living facility, but there are. They're just very, very afraid of coming out. Um, the movie, poster that I have over here on the side is Generation Silent. If you haven't seen this film, it's phenomenal. Please, please watch it. It's actually free on the Canopy app, K-A-N-O-P-Y. Um, and it, at the very least, please go to YouTube and watch the trailer. It's like four minutes, but it really just shows, it's a documentary about older adults feeling that they need to go back into the closet um, for fear of discrimination. It's, it's a really, um, it's a great content film. It's not the best editing, um, but it, it's made 
kind of a while ago. Um, so current socio-political challenges, I mean, we don't have time to go over all the social political challenge um, going on, but conversion therapy is still legal in this country. Um, last June, um, under the previous administration, uh, they reversed Rule 1557, which directly provided um, anti-discrimination policies. So now healthcare providers, there's a little clause in there that healthcare providers can discriminate against LGBTQ folks. Um, so hopefully this rule will go back into effect um, with the new administration. Um, there are many states that have laws that allow people to reject service to LGBTQ folks to anyone based on religious or moral objection. Hate crimes have gone up, especially for our transgender population. Um, there's, there's very few schools that have um, policies that protect LGBTQ students. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard about the Equality Act that is now in Congress. It passed in the House. I hope it passes in the Senate. Basically, what the Equality Act will do is give overall protections for LGBTQ people. It's, it's basically amending the civil rights um, protections of the 60s and, and adding sexual orientation and gender identity into there. It would be the biggest protection that we've ever had. It's 2021 and our community still does not have full and equal protections under the law, under the federal law. There are states that have, have done some good work um, and made protections in each individual state, but not the whole country. So hopefully the Equality Act will pass um, and there will be more protections. Um, so affirming, this is, this is a really big topic. I mean, we just talked about all this doom and gloom and these really, you know, very grim stats. Um, but these stats exist because of the, the lack of affirming entities. So policies, laws, churches, education, families, schools, healthcare providers, all those things have to really, all these systems have been designed to be oppressive. Um, so we're working against an oppressive system. So it is an uphill battle. So this is, I mean, in theory, we would have an affirming society where LGBTQ folks are affirmed by everyone in society. We are definitely not there yet. In my opinion, I think we're somewhere between tolerance and acceptance. And in some parts of the country, maybe in between acceptance and support, um, but we are nowhere near affirming our LGBTQ folks um, in society in general. Um, and so we do have a, a lot of work to do. So the fact that you're here, the fact that you're learning these statistics and how you can help mitigate these statistics is a really big step. So, okay, I know I've talked a lot about doom and gloom, so I really want to get into how to create a welcoming environment. Um, and this starts, you know, at the organizational level, at the CEO level, at the, at the like, if you, if it's your business, great, you have more control. Um, if you are just an employee, you know, there are things you can do as an employee. I'm, I'm usually just an employee, but trust me, my voice can be very loud and squeaky and I can get things changed um, if you are persistent enough. Um, and so things that, that an organization can do to be more affirming. So make sure that your staff is trained, have a training like this one, have someone come in and give a training. You know, SAGE is a really wonderful organization that is specific to older adults. Um, and they're based in New York City and they come and do trainings. They're probably virtual now and they give you different levels of um, certification depending on you know, what kind of training your staff has had. Um, I highly recommend SAGE, especially if you're working with older adults. Make sure your policies include sexual orientation, gender identity. Um, like I said, we don't have federal protections for these non-discrimination policies yet. So each individual state and entity has to create these policies. So if I go to a new job and I see that only, you know, sex and gender is in the non-discrimination policy, I'm going to say, why don't you have sexual orientation and gender identity in there? Because that's inherently um, exclusive. Um, making sure your intake forms have a spot for pronoun, for chosen name, for their care partner, for their spouse. Um, you know, it's those little things, you know, when, when I go into a doctor's office and I, I'm looking at the intake form and I don't see like a spot to put pronouns and chosen name and putting my wife's name, you know, I'm going to feel a little bit less hesitant there or a little bit more hesitant there. Being an ally means calling out homophobic, transphobic, racist things when, that, when those people are not around. Um, so if someone's making a really terrible, you know, homophobic or racist joke, and maybe there's no people of color or no LGBTQ people around, 
Um, that doesn't mean that you should let that joke or comment slide. Those are, that's when you need to step in and be an ally and say, hey, that's not cool. Why would you say that? You know, that, that's not a, an okay thing to say. And trust me, it's really, really hard to speak up, especially when these people are your managers, your colleagues, your friends, your family. Um, it really is a practice to like speak up because we've, we've so often just like kept quiet and let those jokes kind of roll off. Um, but this is the time to step up. Making sure that you have welcoming signage, whether that's on your social media, um, out front of your door, um, if you have a physical business, uh, wearing a pin on your, on your clothing. Obviously, I just decided to wear a whole rainbow today. Um, but you know, putting a flag outside your front door is, is a really welcoming thing you can do. Having an employee resource group um, in your organization. Employee resource groups um, can be for, for any community, really. Um, at Hopkins, we have one. At Frederick Health, we have one. Um, you know, some people just call them like a diversity committee, but some folks like at Hopkins, we actually break it down. So we have a, a Latinx committee, we have a Black committee, we have an LGBT committee. It's really awesome because we can get things done for very specific groups. So, I mean, even if you just have like an umbrella diversity committee, that's a really great place to start. Strength in numbers. Um, because th that group can make recommendations to the shareholders, to the CEO, to the administration and say, hey, you know what, why don't we put a rainbow flag out for June? Why don't we put a little um, article in our newsletter? Or, hey, why don't we make sure that there's gay couples um, and interracial couples represented in our, in our marketing? Those are those things that they can recommend and that hopefully, you know, um, if, if an organization is, is willing to hear that, um, that can be really, you know, make it make it about money if you have to. You know, you're going to get more um, business if you advertise to more people. Um, sharing your name and your pronouns when you introduce yourself to someone, put it on your badge. I brought my badge up here so you can see it. You know, I have a bunch of rainbows on my badge. Um, I have my pronouns on my badge. I put my I put my little rainbow stuff, my trans flag. Um, and that way, you know, just walking in the room, a patient that knows what that means or a family member that knows what that means already feels safe, already knows that I'm a safe person. Um, putting it on your Zoom right, right here, how you see I put in my Zoom in parentheses, I have my name and then my pronouns. You can put on your social media, on your email signature, on your LinkedIn. These are really great ways to show that you are inclusive. Um, Pride is a really big event. Pride in DC is such an event. I'm sad that it's not going to happen this year, but I'm, I'm glad it's not going to happen this year because we're in a pandemic. Um, but pride is such a big event. So if your organization can participate in a local pride parade or a local pride event, you can get your name out there as being inclusive, as affirming. Um, DC Pride is wonderful. DC Pride is like a whole thing. And we're always there as Sibley. Um, you know, you can just get a booth set up, you know, bring your flyers and, and tell the community, hey, we want you to come here because if you're not reaching out to us, we might not even know that you exist. Um, gender neutral bathrooms. This is actually a DC law. If the bathroom is a single stall bathroom, it should be gender neutral. Maryland is working on this law and a couple other states have this law. Gender neutral bathrooms are great for everyone. One. Gender neutral bathrooms, um, you know, say you are an adult that has a disability and you have a care provider. Um, you want a gender neutral bathroom where those folks can all go in and help you. If you're a dad with your two daughters, like you probably want like a family gender neutral bathroom so you can just be safe with your kids instead of sending them off into, you know, the women's room or the men's room. Um, and so gender neutral bathrooms are great for everyone. As a personal person for your friends and for your family, you know, make sure you, you are being inclusive as well. So recognize the needs in your specific community. And how do you do this? You ask. Um, your patients will probably tell you like a list of things that are wrong in, in your part of the world um, because there's a lot of specific barriers to care in different parts of, you know, whether you're in DC or Maryland or um, even different parts of Maryland. Um, and obviously, like I heard New York and New Jersey and Chicago were all represented here today, too. Um, so there are different barriers to care. So just ask your community, like, hey, what can we do as an organization? Which is in June, LGBTQ History Month, which is in October. Um, you know, put those things on your on your calendar, you know, that all the clients get. Um, those things make a difference. If, if I don't see myself represented, like I'm gonna feel excluded. 
um, making sure you are using inclusive language. We talked about gender neutral language, making sure you're introducing yourself with your pronouns and asking your clients how they want to be referred. Um, this is going to show that person that you are inclusive. Um, you know, usually I'll have like a rainbow pin on like every item of clothing that I have um, or a pronoun pin. Um, and that way folks that know what that means knows what that means. Most people, you know, on my day to day when I work in the emergency room, like nobody usually says anything about my pronoun pin unless they actually know what that means. And then they'll be like, oh yeah, my daughter or my grandkid. Or then they'll tell me the whole story of someone that they know. Um, or like my granddaughter just started using she pronouns. You know, I've heard like the best stories come out of just wearing a pin um, and it just shows that, that you're a safe person. And we talk about rainbow flags on your building, on your marketing materials, on your social media. Um, you know, don't just be like the corporate rainbow people in June, um, be inclusive all year round because we see that as a community. We see folks, you know, just as the corporations, they'll, they'll turn their logo rainbow for June and then they will not be inclusive for the rest of the year. It's just like a show. Um, but, you know, throughout the year, have events for your older adults or highlight other organizations and other folks doing those sort of events. Um, here are the resources in Maryland and DC. Um, I know I heard folks from other places, but um, Fenway is international. Um, SAGE is international, or not international, or national organization. So Fenway Institute has LGBTQ education that is free. You get CMEs for it. It's wonderful. I recommend it to everybody. It's great, great education. And you can get very, very specific education on the Fenway. Just go to the Fenway Institute um, learning modules. SAGE is specifically for LGBTQ older adults. It's a really wonderful organization. I highly recommend that you check it out. Um, those of us in DC, we have the DC LGBT Center. They run support groups. They have all sorts of stuff. If you're, if you're new to the community or you have a patient and you're like, I, I don't know where to send them, send them to the DC Center. That's a great place to start. If you're a parent or friend or family member of someone that's queer, PFLAG has been around for like decades. They are the, the parents helping organization. This is where all the parents and friends and family go and say, oh my gosh, my daughter just came out and I don't know how to support her. I don't understand. This is where you go. These folks are going to support you. Gender Spectrum is an online um, platform that's all support groups for all different sorts of people. And right now everything is online. So Gender Spectrum is a great way to go. Trans Maryland has a lot of resources specific for trans folks in Maryland. All right, that was a lot of information in a short amount of time. I think we're right at the question asking portion. So here is my contact information. I will be sending out the slides to Robin um, as well as a PDF with a little bit of terminology and some like quick tips. All right, question time. There's a lot of chat in the box. Hey Claire. It's Robin. Um, so I, while people are posting other questions, I have a, a couple that some came to me, some were kind of floating through as you were um, <clears throat> going through things. So I'll just start with a couple. Um, this was early on in your presentation when you were talking about um, pronouns. And at the bottom of your slide, you had, I, I wrote it quickly, Z-I and H-I-R-S. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about that? Um, I don't know that you addressed that. So somebody asked about it and I, um, so I thought I would, we can go back to that. Yeah, let me go back to that slide. So Z, Zier, and Zier's, or Z here and here's, there's different ways to pronounce. Um, this is, so, you know, people are like, I cannot get they, them, and theirs. That is, I can't do it. That's just, you know, I can't do that pronoun. So there's other pronouns out there that you can use instead. Um, I actually, like, if you think about Z, he, she, that kind of like sounds very similar. Um, it is a gender neutral pronoun that a lot of folks will use. Not a lot of people use them. I would say more younger population is starting to use these pronouns more and more. Um, just, I don't expect you to know them at all. Just keep them in the very back of your mind to say like, oh yeah, I know what that means. That's a gender neutral pronoun. It's not he, it's not she. Um, let me have you just start with they, them, and theirs, but know that those exist. There are more pronouns out there. Um, there's just other pronouns that people use. Great. You're on mute, Robin. So sorry, there was another question that came through actually um, about um, bisexual versus pansexual. Can you speak a little bit more about that? 
Yeah, so bisexual means that you are attracted to your gender and a gender that's not your own. And pansexual means I'm attracted to you for you. Like gender has nothing to do with it. I just, I fell in love with you or I'm, I have this vibe with you. I'm attracted to you for you. Gender has like nothing to do with it. Um, so that's why I'm seeing a lot younger folk, a lot more younger folks using it because they're being more open. They're like, oh, let me just hang out with this person and see if I like them. Oh yeah, I like them. Oh cool, they're, they're a guy or oh cool, they're a girl or cool, they're non-binary. Gender has nothing to do with, with their attraction. Great, thank you for that clarification. Um, uh, before I go, um, we will be including this presentation with the follow-up um, email that we'll be sending to everyone. That question came through a couple times, so I just wanted to put it out there for everyone. Um, Claire, somebody asked if you do this presentation for non-medical um, non-medical organizations. Yep, I sure do. Awesome. Anyone? Great. So um, you'll all get Claire's information in the follow-up. Um, I think there was some conversation about um, LGBTQ friendly physicians and is there a publication available? There was a little back and forth, I think about Grows producing something and Kathleen, I think you mentioned Steve Ho produced something. Claire, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, so gender neutral, or sorry, um, LGBTQ affirming providers, glama, G-L-M-A dot org has a really robust um, list of everybody, doctors, nurses, um, social workers, speech therapists, the whole nine. Um, it's, it's a self-identified list. So folks that put themselves on the list do it with them, like they just do it. There's no like credentialing around it. Um, I have worked very hard for Sibley providers to um, have a list. So we do have a list of Sibley providers that are LGBT affirming. It's also self-identified. Um, the good thing about DC is there is a minimum requirement of two years of, L of LGBT education that all providers have to have, whether you're a social worker, nurse practitioner, respiratory therapist, it doesn't matter, massage therapist. Um, so that Sibley has a list of Sibley providers, um, you know, and we've broken it down into different specialties like neurology, you know, emergency, GYN, things like that. So, but I would first check out GLAMA, G-L-M-A dot org. Also, the... Um... Positive Aging Sourcebook has a, a page this year on LGBTQT friendly businesses and companies like Smith Life Home Care that are SAGE certified. Um, that simply means a certain amount of your staff needs to be trained in cultural diversity. Awesome. Great, thank you, Kathleen. Um, any other questions? I, I, I think I've addressed them all. If I didn't, please pop it into the chat. Um, just as a reminder, um, if you did need continuing education credit, um, you know, we'll be uh, sending the report to HFAM. And um, if you email painter, P-A-I-N-T-E-R at CESLC.org, I'll put it in the chat again, uh, we'll get you your certificate. Um, Kathleen, would you like to um, uh, and, uh, round us out and end it? Sure. Um, just a, a final thank you, Claire. As always, you are amazing. Um, your presentations are so useful in the community, educational, and everybody will walk away to debtor today better informed than they were when they showed up today, I think. At least I will. Um, so thank you all. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to bring this information to you. Smith Life Home Care um, is here. Please give us a call if you need any of our SAGE certified caregivers. Thank you, Robin and everyone else for being part of um, our presentation today. We appreciate you. Thank you all. Bye.